Modern air combat is incredibly lethal, so anyone going into a fight wants to accomplish their mission and get home as fast as possible. Getting drawn into a lengthy dogfight can be fatal because it gives the adversary time to bring in help. So how do we end the fight more quickly? The answer is to bring a friend. And the tactics you and your friend will use are collectively known as air combat maneuvering. When your adversaries are flying fighters that can go Mach 1 or faster, they can cover over 11 nautical miles in one minute. So if it takes you two minutes to kill an enemy in a dogfight, that means that every one of his friends within 22 miles will be on you. And if they have missiles that can reach out 10 miles, then that radius gets extended out to 32 miles. You can easily find yourself in deep trouble if your enemy just drags out the fight. But if you can cut that time down to just 30 seconds, then the only ones that can come to his aid have to be within 5 or 6 miles. At that distance, they're already in the fight. Anyone else won't be able to get there in time. That's why it's so important to be able to keep these fights as short as possible. Throwing extra pilots at the problem doesn't always help either. Everyone needs to follow a coordinated plan. Without a plan, it could take just as long as doing it solo, or it might actually cause more problems, like trying to figure out who is a friend or an enemy. To better understand this, it helps to look at how air combat maneuvering tactics evolved over time. Then we can look at how they're used today. The oldest ACM tactics were formulated back in the First World War, before the advent of radio. So they were fairly simple. The most common one was known as fighting wing. In the era before widespread use of surveillance radar, the biggest threat to combat aircraft was being ambushed from a blind spot. So naturally, tactics evolved to put a wingman into a position to watch that blind spot. That's what fighting wing is all about. Now there are a lot of variations on the exact positioning, but the basic fighting wing formation put the wingman in a cone behind lead like this. The wingman was free to move around anywhere inside it, as long as he was able to watch for enemy fighters going after lead. Then lead was free to focus on hunting down their target. The maximum range between fighters was determined by the turn radius. At no point could the wingman ever go beyond one turn radius from lead. This ensured wing could quickly go after any ambushers sneaking in for a shot at lead. Minimum range was based on possible closure rates. So enough room would have to be left to give the wingman time to prevent an overshoot if lead lost speed because of maneuvering. Out front, the wingman couldn't really do much to stop an ambusher in the rear. These ranges changed over time as aircraft performance improved. In World War I, that would have been 20 to 200 feet. But once jets became involved, those numbers could grow to 300 and 3,000 feet. Fighting wing is a lot like Wedge from the Tactical Formations video. And it wasn't just a formation, but a doctrine. As Top Gun instructor Robert Shaw said in his book Fighter Combat, once the engagement begins, the fighting wing leader essentially fights the opponent one versus one, while the wingman hangs on for dear life. This doctrine worked to keep the flight lead safe from ambushes, but it had some downsides. One is that you're not taking full advantage of the firepower available to two aircraft. It's essentially a solo fight. Another is that lead can't use maximum throttle because this wouldn't give the wingman any leeway to catch up. Once a full throttle leader pulls away from his wingman, the wingman would have no way of getting back into position. But it did have a positive aspect. It didn't take long to train a new pilot to be a wingman in fighting wing. And it was a great way for that new pilot to learn when paired with the veteran leader. But as time went on, fighter pilots did find better ways to fight. Fighting wing was the predominant doctrine during World War II, but during that war a lot of fighter pilots developed alternatives that gave wingmen a little bit more independence. This was in large part due to the introduction of radios, which let pilots coordinate their tactics. They also found that sometimes you could do more with a little separation. Let's take a look at an example of what this looks like. Just like in fighting wing, the support fighter is watching out for his engaged wingman. The objective here is to clear the airspace around the fight for any other bandits trying to sneak in. But the support fighter also wants to be prepared to jump in if needed. So a good idea here is to build some altitude so that can be traded in for speed. If the engaged fighter calls for help, then the support fighter will be in a good position to act. 
Now let's say the bandit sees this potential attack and decides to switch targets. Because of the flexibility of double attack, the support fighter can easily swap roles and become the engaged fighter. This significantly cuts down on how long the engagement lasts, because the support fighter has the freedom to maneuver at will and into an offensive position on the bandit. This freedom comes from the engaged fighter keeping the bandit focused and moving in a predictable fashion. If you've watched my BFM series, then you know how much easier it is to maneuver on an unaware bandit. That's the real power behind establishing these roles. As Shaw says in his book Fighter Combat, by using these methods, a pair of fighters can defeat even a more capable adversary. And that's because even a more powerful fighter will bleed energy trying to get into a good offensive position. With the support fighter up high, there's an opportunity to build up speed during a dive when called in for the attack. Just like with previous doctrines, pilots would come up with newer variations that let them do more. Let's take a look at one of those. During the Vietnam War, a new philosophy was developed which was more of a variation on double attack than something brand new. This variant of ACM was dubbed Loose Deuce. Just like how Double Attack gave the support fighter a little more freedom over fighting wing, Loose Deuce does the same thing. In Double Attack, the support fighter is primarily concerned with covering the engaged fighter, and as Shaw describes it, should not engage until he is called in by the engaged pilot. However, in Loose Deuce, there's no need to wait for a call from the engaged fighter. The support fighter is always maneuvering for a shot while also deconflicting from the engaged fighter. In double attack, you never have two fighters on the offensive at the same time. It's always just the engaged fighter on the offensive. And if that offensive position is ever in danger of being lost, then the support fighter is called in and roles are reversed. That's not the case in loose deuce, where the support fighter has the freedom to take a shot without having to get permission first. One thing that does stay the same between both doctrines is that it is the engaged fighter that has the focus of the bandit. So the engaged fighter is still the one forcing the bandit to fly predictably while the support fighter lines up for a shot. And if the bandit ever switches focus, then the roles will swap too. So in loose deuce, you can expect the support fighter to get the kill more often. This is the opposite of double attack, where the engaged fighter was the one that worked exclusively on getting the kill. Remember, this is all about predictability. The bandit must be kept on a steady game plan long enough for the support fighter to move in for a kill. This is especially important when only rear quarter weapons like IR missiles are available. So the engaged fighter needs to keep up steady and unrelenting pressure without pulling any risky maneuvers that might cause the bandit to change plans. Like a reversal. When the bandit changes geometry, it means a support fighter has to start over and this extends the time it takes to get the kill. When everything is done right in loose deuce, it offers the possibility for the fastest kill. But it requires training and experience to get it right. The US Air Force teaches loose deuce and calls it air combat maneuvering. In this series, we'll go over how that works step by step and set up some practice scenarios so you can experience it for yourself. The goal of this series is to teach you how to use ACM to get you to your victory more quickly. Preferably, that's going from the merge to a kill in under 30 seconds. Now is a good time to see how long that takes you so we have a good baseline to measure against. Then at the end of the series, see how much you improved over that baseline. After learning ACM, I was able to consistently get it down to 30 seconds or less with the help of a trained wingman. So I know you can do it too. The next video will focus on how to determine who is the engaged fighter and who is the support fighter, and how you can communicate the plan with each other. Then we'll go over some scenarios that put you in offensive and defensive postures. It'll be critical to use ACM in these scenarios to win with both fighters still alive in the end. So keep an eye out for that video and thanks for watching.